Dr. Modin is going to continue on the troubleshooting classes today, and then on Monday we have our final tutorial for this course, where we'll be repeating one of the exercises like we did last time, except every group will be shuffled around again, and you'll be looking at a case study you haven't seen before. So it's your final chance to give this a go in an, in an environment where the, really the consequences are, are nothing of getting it wrong. It's, it's more for you just to experience it once again, see how far you can get. Many of you succeeded last time in identifying the problem. Uh, let's see this time now that you have a bit more of a systematic method, uh, if you can get a little further, if you didn't succeed last time. Okay, so really critical you show up on time. Uh, there's a little bit more writing to do afterwards every time, so you're going to have to stick to the timing quite carefully. So please be sure to arrive on time. Thanks. Okay, good morning. So we're, we're going to finish up this part here, the drooping temperature example. And we got through engage and find and explore, and now we're working on the plan. And this is our little table guide us on, on planning. We're going to end up working on hypotheses, checking versus our initial information. We're going to eliminate some, maybe. We're going to clarify the working hypotheses. Uh, and then we're going to come up with additional diagnostic actions to see if we can uh, disprove everything but one. If we have, if the true root cause is in our list. If not, then we have to go back and do some more hypotheses. So we have some working hypotheses, and there's a little bit of room here at the bottom. Does anybody want to add another working hypothesis to this? Or cause I know you stayed up last night and you were thinking about this several hours. Okay, well, we'll work on these. So our initial information is that the temperature at the outlet of the heater is going down sort of accelerating going down. The feed rate's constant, the fuel rate's going up. Uh, so, air flow rates in the furnace. Oops, okay, we have to clarify this one. Uh, is, what, what is the problem? Does anybody remember? Somebody, somebody nominated this one. So, I, uh, we have names associated with it. We're not that good. No takers. What's the airflow rate of the furnace? What would be the hypothesis? That it's too high, it's too low, it's stopped? Yeah, too low. It's too low. Okay. So we have the airflow rate blocked. The TC control is unstable. The fuel pipe damage is leaking. It's because of the heat in the heater. So we have stack damper closed. Leaving the feet tank and feet at a higher pressure. Okay, so those are root causes, so we can start working with these. Now, uh, why don't you take a minute? So we're going to have <coughs> columns here. We're going to use um, D is equal to disprove, S is equal to support. And N is equal to neutral. Okay. So, uh, what we want to figure out is whether this piece of information supports this working hypothesis, disproves the working hypothesis, or is neutral. It just doesn't tell us one way or the other. Okay, so why don't you take a few minutes work through a couple of these and then so, so each one of these spots here we're going to put one of these three letters. <coughs> the idea is that we're going to be able to then if we get a D, we get a D anywhere, that means we've got to at least preliminarily eliminate that working hypothesis. So some piece of information has disproved that hypothesis. Now we have to make sure that these are really, we're pretty sure that these are true. 
may have to come back and let's say uh, if this sensor's wrong, then we may have to come back and not use this this proof uh, hypothesis if, if we ultimately conclude maybe the sensor is supposed to be. Didn't we already go and check this kind of technology? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's conceptual. Okay, so each one of these. So for the fuel, the same thing. So take a couple minutes and work with your friends and try and fill out a bit of that paper. Yes, the wrong is the forest complaint. It's like likely the other is it just could. Well, just could, yeah. It doesn't it, it's so we're not we're not proving any of these are true, but if this data is consistent with that information, then it supports it. It doesn't absolutely prove it. Okay? <coughs> question. Any other questions about this procedure? It's like some philosophy class going on. Logic. Philosophy. Okay, so take a couple minutes and talk with your friends and work on that and then we'll we'll, 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 uh, we'll share our results. I would say that. I would say it's the noise level has to go way up here because we're all working together as a team. Let me see you're ready. Thank you. 
So we're going to talk a little bit more about this Tuesday. We'll, talk, we'll look at cause-effect diagrams and see how we can go from intermediate causes to final root causes. Because ultimately, we, we need to get me this specific. This sort of gets us a bit of the way there, but we still can't prove the problem. So let's, so for this one, since this is essentially the same, that's really going to be. Now here's the one. TC controller is unstable. Unstable. So what did a Dr. Schwartz's teaching the process control. If the system went unstable, it would start to oscillate like this. Okay. So if this were the temperature, and this were the set point, if the process were unstable, and you probably did that in one of your exercises, you simulated, if you put the wrong tuning constants in, the system could go unstable. So if we were here, at, uh, at the end of our little transient, this is where we, this is, would be the future. This could be a cause of the problem. <coughs> Everybody agree? No. If you don't agree, say, wait a minute, I object. Is that true? Controllers go unstable. <coughs> Operators hate you to do that. Don't let your controllers go unstable because they'll get mad at you. Okay, so so the temperature control is unstable. Temperature going down and increasingly going down, is that would that be consistent with that hypothesis? You're gonna take a vote. This is like Chicago, not like Chicago. You only get one vote. Can't vote twice. So you either vote for neutral support or disproof. And you gotta raise your hand. We're gonna turn this camera around. around. So you take, if you don't raise your hand, minus five points, right? <laughs> How many think that right here the temperature going down could support the hypothesis. Okay. You've got to vote too. Uh, okay, how many are how many are neutral? Neutral? How many disprove? It's like a third each. <laughs> so, so so this is we don't know what's going on in the future, but we have a hypothesis that all this is going to happen in the future. So yes, that could be that could be a cause. The oscillation has started. We haven't. We're, we'd have to wait and see. So this is this would support. This would be neutral. And while the temperature is going down, the control would make the fuel go up. That supports that. So it could be that the system is starting is starting to oscillate. Pipe uh, damaged. Uh, a leak after F1. Okay, so who did that? Who's joining? So if the fuel pipe is, is leaking, would that cause the temperature to go down? Yeah, that supports it. This is neutral, and the fuel pipe is leaking. What would happen to F2, the flow rate? Yeah, the controller would try and increase it, so it would be opening the valve, and we'd get more flow through the through the uh, flow meter, but that would be leaking before it got to the it got to the uh, it got to the flame. So that's a really serious one, right? That's really bad. Uh, a leak, so a flu, flu gas leaking from the heater. Um, 
because this is a very big, uh, it'd be about three, four stories high, three heater. It's a very big furnace. It's not like something in your basement you heat your house with. Uh, so it's a very big uh, vessel, and it's not very strong. So it does leak. It always leaks a little bit in or out. Uh, so uh, if we get food gas leaking from the heater, uh, so that caused the temperature of number one to go down a little bit, a little bit. Okay, so we may say support here, but we're going to put a question mark here because unless the wall blew off of it or something, uh, and then we know really fast, these flames would be shooting out. Uh, it probably isn't a strong enough effect, but we, you know, we might. This is neutral. And support here, but again with a question mark. Because it's probably not a strong enough effect to cause the immediate and large changes that we see. Okay, the stack damper closed. So that's the in the smokestack, the, there's a little valve up there, like a butterfly valve. And if that went closed, so, so so, uh, the process control, you talked about fail open and fail closed valves. Should the stack damper be a fail open or a fail closed valve? Open, right? So we, we don't want to hold the pressure in the system. It should be a fail open valve. So failing closed would be <coughs> fail unsafe. So it's less likely to happen, but that doesn't mean it can't happen. So if the stack damper failed closed, what would happen? Well, what would happen is if I close that, the pressure in the whole vessel is going to increase. Right? So the first thing that's going to happen is the pressure is going to go skyrocketing up. Now it's not a it's not a it's not a tight valve. I mean you can think about this, it's a big stack like this. And you've got a valve in there, and when it closes, there'll still be leaks. Otherwise, it would explode. So it's still going to be leaks, but the pressure's going to go up. And that's going to mean more resistance to getting the air and the fuel in. So, so the first thing that would happen is both of those flow rates would drop. But then their flow controllers would say, I want more, so I'm going to open the valve and push more in. So the first result is that pressure in the in the stack, in the, in the furnace is going to go really high. Um, what would that do to the temperatures? I don't really know. Um, it, because so many other bad things would happen immediately, that because uh, we damage the vessel, you know, we, we could we could start bulging the walls out and it would start leaking. So, but is there something we can do over here to do a diagnostic? Oh, wrong place here. Do a diagnostic action for this for this heater. Check the check the pressure. I think we have a pressure sensor there. Somewhere on. Do we have a pressure sensor on this? So we're going to check the pressure in the firebox. So, so we'll leave this. We'll leave this as neutral. Uh, a leak in the feed tank. If we had a leak in the feed tank. Would that be consistent with the feed rate being constant? Well, potentially yes. Potentially no. I think it's neutral. <coughs> um, the reason is, I mean, it's a completely leak empty. Then we couldn't, we wouldn't have feet. But until it, until it uh, went empty, it still could be leaking. There still could be enough material in the tank to provide the feed to the plant. So, but would that, if the feed rate's constant, would that cause the temperature to go down? It, 
doesn't see the tank, so we, we can have it disproved here and disproved here. So we can take the leak and the feed tank. Okay, and finally, feed at a higher pressure. So the, the so maybe somebody turned out, we didn't realize that somebody turned out a, a, a spare pump. Now the feed's at a higher pressure. We didn't know, but they told, turned it out, and they're supposed to tell us, but they didn't tell us. So. Now the feed supply is at a higher pressure. Immediately, you'd get more flow in the feed rate. And then what would happen? Feed controller would Yeah, so, so it would close the valve a little bit. So we'd be getting right back to the same flow rate. So it's 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 neutral here, but would that cause any change in the temperature? So we just prove the temperature, we just prove it. So we got rid of this one. Okay, so we've got some working hypotheses now that we've just proved two of them to our satisfaction. We still have a lot that are candidates, which is normal. That's a typical thing. That's, because normally we don't have enough information to immediately find the single root cause. So, any of these, maybe not this one, but any of the others, these up here, could be the root cause. So we could solve the problem today and end up with one root cause. We could have the same thing happen tomorrow with exactly the same initial symptoms and have a different root cause. So it, even if you've seen a, a problem occur in the past, you don't want to jump and say, okay, I know that's the root cause. I may know, I know because of my past experience, now I know there are seven or eight possible root causes rather than the, the hundred I was thinking about before I started the problem in the first place. Okay, so, so now we need some diagnostic actions. So um, why don't you work for a few minutes on the remaining working hypotheses. How can we check to see if any of these are true? <coughs> So take a few minutes and work on that in your rooms. Noise level up.
Consider the fact that maintenance might have messed up calibration on the flow rate on the flow uh, transmitters. Okay, so so whatever you so for maintenance, um, which flow rate? Um, we don't know which ones they're working on, but it could have been the fuel oil F2. Okay, so put that in there. Uh, so so the P3. So this. F5, it should equal its set point, because that's a controller. Does the measurement actually equal the set point? And is P3 approximately equal to the, the typical value? Uh, a couple of atmospheres or whatever that, that compressor's doing now. So this is in the control house. This might be in the control house, and this might require walking up to the the unit and what you've got a local sensor. Okay, so these two things would give us information about these two these two hypotheses. The air too low and the airflow blocked. So definitely we, we could just we could prove or disprove the airflow is blocked by by the flow rate, the direct measurement. Okay, what about TC1 controller unstable? If, the contro if we think the controller is causing oscillations, what can we do to check? <coughs> okay, so 
Okay, go ahead. So TC1, we'll guess, we can switch that to manual. And that's three. And if everything stopped and everything went back to normal, then, then maybe it was a control. Okay, so we've got the pressure. Okay, let's give I'll give you some feedback on these. Um, is it an auto? Yes, it's an auto. <coughs> okay, so the, so, so the TC1 is in auto now. The firebox pressure, pressure is approximately normal in the firebox. So that's going to disprove this one. It's okay. So, and the P3 is unchanged. Okay. So we've eliminated that the pipe is blocked. And if we put this in manual, what happens is I'll just plot these. T1 is going down. I put it in manual. So this is where I put it in manual. It levels off and flow 2 is going up. And it levels off. So this is where we are now. We've done some diagnostic actions. We've gotten some feedback. We're like a little triad here, or we're a big triad, we're a huge triad. So we've eliminated some. Fuel pipe is damaged. Oh, okay, so we got to go out and, and, and physically check the fuel. This is the job you don't want, right? Go out there and see if the methane is there, the fuel oil spewing all over the place. So you have to do a visual uh, check of the fuel. Pipe and that is over here. There's no leak. That's good. That's good news. Uh, okay. So is there? We haven't gotten yet to the problem yet, to the root cause. Let's go back over the scenario, what happened. We increased the feed rate the first time, everything worked. Okay. We increased the feed the second time, and the temperature started to drop. The fuel went up because the controller needed more, more fuel because of the increased feed rate. Went up for a while, and then it started to take off. Here's our little problem again. 
Anybody want to take one last shot at the root cause? You're very close. Yes. Um, is there, is there, okay, never mind. Because it's, it's really up there. We did something to cause the problem. Okay, here's what happened. We increased the feed rate, and initially the temperature decreased. Okay. Because of the lower temperature, the controller increased the fuel rate. When I increase the fuel rate, look at my system. The air is constant. The air is constant. So I decreased my air to fuel ratio because my air is constant. I didn't have enough air. So for a long time, I had, here's, here's if I think of stoichiometry as they're equal, the fuel was below the air. So I could operate in that region very, very happily. At some point, I was increasing the production rate, so my fuel rate's going up, and all of a sudden now I have more fuel than I can combust. So the problem wasn't that something bad happened to the air, the problem was the air remained constant when it should have been increased. But there's nothing automatic to increase the air. We're relying on a human being to do that. And apparently the operator forgot today to do that. So increase the green controller, the feed rate increases, the temperature, red temperature drops, we start putting more little fuel in. We keep putting more and more fuel in and keep, if we keep increasing the production rate and we keep the air constant, then we're, we're really having this symptom. But the root cause is not a problem in the air compressor or the air pipe or the air valve. It's just we didn't change the symptom. So what happens? When it's normally operating, as you increase the fuel, the temperature increases. Right? Now in this situation, as you increase the fuel, you're putting more cold fuel into the system and it's not being burned, so you're decreasing the temperature. So that poor red controller up there, that's like driving your car, and if I want to go to the right, I turn to the right. right? Turn, if I want to go to the left, I go to the left. This is like all of a sudden, physics has changed. I need, if I turn to the right, my car goes to the left. So the control is just going to run away and be unstable. So if we think about that from process control, 3P4, everybody remembers that. That's the best one. Uh, what's this laughter? The process gain has changed. The sign of the process gain has changed. And the controller doesn't know that. So the controller is making exactly the wrong correction in the wrong direction. So, nothing wrong. The whole system is, nothing broke down, but the system is badly designed, or is poorly designed, for requiring a, an operator to change that air flow rate. And the operator doesn't know how much air is required because there's no measurement. Right, so. It's like saying, I want you to keep this air in excess of the fuel, and the operator says, well, how do I know it's in excess? Oh, we're not going to tell you. We're not going to give you that extra sensor because it costs too much money. And then what happens? You burn down a $5 million heater. And then you blame the operator. Never blame the engineer. All right, so, so this design, does everybody see what happened here? As we increase the production rate, we put more and more fuel in until we were air deficient. Okay, so, oh my gosh, we've just discovered the root cause. So it's related to this, and, and, and we now know the root cause. So how do we fix the problem quickly? We've got to fix the problem quickly. What do we do in the plan? Yes. Return the feed to the set point before that. Okay, that'll do it. Yes? Uh, short term, you manually open up the air, air flow valve, and long term, you, you okay. say. I, I want somebody to say that. 
Because that's the initial reaction, but when you do that, you blow the plant up. That's not good. So why don't you put the air in? Yeah. We built up fuel in there, so does it um, all combust at once and get explosion? Yeah. So we have a system that's dangerous. It has uncombusted fuel in this big vessel. So we don't want to put air in. What do we want to do? We want to reduce the fuel. So the first thing we do is we reduce the fuel. We keep reducing the fuel until we're sure that there's excess air. So we don't put air in. And that's even why it, in, in these kinds of situations, it's bad to hit the big red button. The big red button is it's dangerous to shut it down because that big red button will put air in. It'll stop the fuel and put air in. So this is a case where you actually want to try and move it to the safe park, and that's uh, you need the human intelligence to do that. Okay, so we need to get out of this dangerous situation. We're going to reduce the fuel. We're going to keep reducing the fuel. And what we can do to be sure is we can take a sample of this gas that's up here. We want to keep reducing the fuel until a couple, what, what disappears from and what appears in this fuel sample that we can take to the laboratory and analyze. What should not be here and what should be there? Yes. You want it to be CO2 and not CO. Yeah. So I don't want any CO. I don't want any methane. I don't want. I don't want any hydrocarbons at all. And I don't want any CO. And to make sure that I have excess air, I want oxygen. So I can. Go, I can take a laboratory sample and take that to the laboratory. Make sure that we have excess oxygen up in in the entire firebox and up in Once I've established that situation, then I have to keep the air high, turn the air up very high, and then sort of re start returning back to normal operation. So that solved the immediate problem. Yes? How would you remove the, like, the excess of fuel as well that just opens the damper and just let it on? Well, um, if you, let's say, if you just open that damper, you're still going to have fuel uncombusted, so it's going to continue to come in. So we've got to make sure we, we vent the system so we run it with extra air for a certain amount of time to, to flush the system out. Which wouldn't take that long. It wouldn't take a 30 seconds or a minute or something. Um, Okay, then we keep, now we're going to turn the air way up, and we're going to operate, put this back in operation. Now we've gotten to an intermediate state. Now how do we fix this problem so it doesn't happen again, which may take some time and some investment? Yes? Uh, put a controller on the air, airflow rate valve to maintain stoichiometric ratio with the fuel left. Okay, so, so we want to, you're right, we want to adjust this automatically so that we don't get into the situation again. And so we want to make sure that there's extra air. Now we could open the valve completely and leave it open. The problem with that is we're putting a huge amount of cold air in here and it comes out here, so our efficiency goes into the tank. So we want to maintain reasonable efficiency. We don't want to put a lot of cold air into the system all the time. Uh, so we're going to try to adjust this to keep it above the stoichiometric, a certain amount above the stoichiometric. What can we measure to make sure if we could, we can buy an analyzer now? We have a budget. We just had a crisis. That's the only way we get any money around here. So we almost killed somebody. We didn't. So now you can go and say, look, we need to invest some money. So we have $15,000, $20,000 to buy an analyzer. What do we want to measure? Yes. Low heat, uh, the fuel heat. Well, we're measuring the fuel. We're measuring the air. No, I mean, have the air control, the controller control the air by measuring the feed flow rate. So the feed, uh, the fuel flow rate. 
Okay. So if the fuel increases, it increases the heat air. Okay, so we talked about, you talked about ratio controllers and, and process control. So you, you can keep a ratio controller. That's a good idea. But then how do you know what's the right ratio? Because these sensors lie. Okay. So it's a good idea to have the ratio controller. But we need something that tells us what the right ratio should be. Yes. Um, analyze the composition of the yeah. So we can put an analyzer up here. We want to make it's going to measure oxygen, and we want to make sure it's three percent, two percent oxygen. And that would come back and either adjust the airflow directly, or change the ratio, adjust the ratio so that we keep the ratio in the right condition. All right. So. First of all, we get out of the emergency situation. We train the people immediately on, on how they should operate the plant. Put in lots and lots of excess air. Take a sample every shift of this flue gas and make sure there's no CO in there. And then ultimately, we have to change the design. In this situation, it's just a simple control design problem. So we have solved the problem. But there's one important message. Uh, oh, I'll tell you the message next class. But okay, so I'll uh, so Tuesday we'll have the important message because I showed this to a real expert in fire heaters. He said it's a wonderful class, but it's a terrible lesson. <laughs> so there's one thing that we we have to consider.